Hi, everybody. I'm Rita McGrath uh, here with Safi Bakal and um, Missy Pereira, uh, <laughs> who is uh, monitoring our chat and whatnot. Um, so this is being recorded. Just uh, my normal disclaimer. Do not type anything or say anything you don't want showing up in something like the Wall Street Journal. Um, <laughs> and, uh, We'll go from there. So let me introduce Safi. Uh, Safi is an author of this fantastic book, which is full of little sticky notes and <laughs> things that I've been reading called Loon Shots. Uh, he's a trained scientist, a recovering consultant, a <laughs> former CEO for many years, and now is doing a lot of thinking, writing, and advising. Um, and who better to talk to during one of the um, most significant pandemics of our lives. So uh, that'll be uh, that'll be great. So maybe just start out with uh, your your journey, how you got to be doing all these interesting things. Um, well, it was a pretty random path. I started off as uh, as we talked about. Actually, you're in Princeton, New Jersey. I grew up in Princeton. Parents, both scientists at the university and the institute in Princeton, and I was a hundred percent sure. Uh, I would be going down the path of being an academic scientist. You and I both write about crazy events and disruptions and how you make left and right turns. Uh, <laughs> well, my career path was certainly a lot of left and right, right turns. I was sure I would be a scientist. I didn't, in fact, set foot off a of university until I was about 29 or 30 years old. Um, then I went, uh, you know, I, I wanted to see... I heard this rumor that there were these things in the world called jobs where people were in office buildings. Because <laughs> you know? I, all I knew was you're know, writing grant proposals and teaching students and you know PhDs. But I heard there was this thing called office buildings. And I actually, I remember I was dating a, a young woman at the time when I was early in grad school. And I said, so you work in an office? What's that like? You know, can I see? I like, it's so odd. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I remember she was a paralegal. I remember asking her, you know, could I just meet people who had jobs, you know? And uh, she said, well, why, why don't you come to a happy hour? You know, then, you know, it's okay. You can bring people. So I went, she was working at this, you know, famous law firm in Silicon Valley. I was at uh, Stanford at the time. So I went to her office and there were all these people standing around the wall with the drinks. I didn't look very happy. And I just went and I asked him, so I, are you happy? Do you? do you like this job? And the answer was like, no, <laughs> unanimously like, no, 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 no. And I was like, this job thing doesn't sound great. Maybe mm. I'll stay in graduate school and do science a little more. So uh, I did actually stay in grad school, uh, PhD, postdoc, actually got a faculty position. Then um, just got really curious about what do 99.9% .9 of human beings do that's not you know, writing grant proposals <laughs> um, and, and publishing papers. And so- And you were um, in physics, right? I was in theoretical physics. Uh, I was at Harvard, then uh, uh, Stanford, then Berkeley. Jeez, I um, wish you'd stop slumming it. <laughs> I know, I know. That sounds kind of, I, I should really, I should find some other line because that just sounds <laughs> obnoxious, even, even though I, you know, I don't mean That's it. That's true. <laughs> and also it's, you know, it's a longer story, but people have this sort of impression of physics as you've got to be this, that, or the other to do it. And I, I actually disagree. I think it's just a matter of interest and commitment. If you work mm -hmm. hard enough uh, and you're trained on it, which I was as a kid, you'll be good at it. Like I will never be a great basketball player. Um, <laughs> there's some genes there. <laughs> I'm a short Jewish guy. So there's some genes there. Um, but uh, I think you know, it, it, with training and commitment, um, you, you can do anything. I think theoretical physics is the same or getting into some of these graduate schools is kind of the same. Uh, anyway, I just got curious about how the world works. What do these people who have jobs do for a living? And I actually, I remember I was getting uh, interviewed for McKinsey in New York and you know, they go through all these interviews and they, they ask you these, you know, you know, these types of questions, these sort of puzzle business questions. Years later, I was the one asking the questions, but in the, in the beginning, they ask these questions. And then at the end, like with many interviews, they say, do you have any questions for us? And every single one I said, yeah, could you, could you explain to me what you do? I I'm sorry, I just don't get it. <laughs> and they're like, well, you know, we advise companies and, you know, solving problems. I'm like, yeah, I don't get it. Like, why don't they solve their own problems? I'm, I'm just not following. <laughs> Could you explain it for me? And they would crack up. You know, it'd be like senior McKinsey directors. Now I knew they were big shots. It, 
at the time I was like, I'm, I'm not following what you're saying. I just hear words, <laughs> not computing. Like, could you walk me through, like you get up in the morning, you, you take a shower, so you get a car, you drive to an office. This was in the before times when there was an office, right? Right. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, you were prophetic. We're all back at where we were before. Now we're back at home. Like you get to the office, you open the door to your office, you put your butt in a chair. And then what happens? Like, I'm not following. Like, what do you actually do? (laughs) So I I was just curious, actually. And uh, they all, I guess, found it was funny. And fortunately, not obnoxious enough to prevent them from hiring me. But that's how I got started. And then found that, you know, McKinsey was like a, sort of like a halfway house between, you know, the, the academic world and the real world before they let loose these crazy academics on the real world. They need to make sure you're okay and can speak to people without drooling. And, you know, and your <laughs> parents work. were not thrilled with this, right? No, they, uh, you know, they were, you talk uh, about the seven stages of denial, <laughs> right? They were committed, committed, scientists and anything outside of science was like a little suspicious. You know, it's actually very funny. It's a lot in common with uh, uh, religion. I, somebody told me this joke. I, I think it was a rabbi told me this joke about Judaism. I think it, it applies to every religion. He says, you know, there's several levels of Judaism, sort of reform is sort of at the lower conservative in terms of how rigorous you, you adhere to the rules. And, uh, Orthodox is very strict. And and what the rabbi said was, at every level, it's always the same. The people a little bit higher are just a little crazy. And the people a little bit below, not really Jewish. (laughs) So at every level, it's like, you're at just the right level. And one's, you know, the ones above. So, um, you know, I think my parents had similar attitude towards academia. Like academia, you're, you're kind of doing the right level of concentration and focus for truth. And if you're in the business world, it's not really, you know, maybe you're solving problems, but it's not really, you know, and then there are the crazies in academics, like the pure mathematicians, you know, no connection to the real world. <laughs> so, uh, but yes, no, when I, I uh, came out to them that I might be exploring something outside the faith, uh, it was, it was uh, a tragic tragic moment. It was actually very funny. It was a scene in Princeton. Speaking of Princeton, we were um, at some, um, some event space in Princeton, I forget, for a, 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 a wedding, uh, the, the, a pre-wedding event for some family friends. The daughter was getting married. And uh, uh, I was back in town from grad school or from wherever. And uh, I was standing just behind my parents. And uh, they were talking to the, the, the parents of the, the, the daughter that was getting married. And they, I don't think they knew that I was just, I happened to be right behind them talking to somebody else. And there was a lull in my conversation so I could hear what they were saying. And the parents, like most parents say, well, well what is your you know, son up to? And they said, well, you know, you know I, and this, he had this nice academic career going. And they said, um, my parents said, oh yeah, he's doing great. You know, he got this faculty position and he's pursuing, I'm like, uh, I left academia. I just started at McKinsey. Like what's and and then they said, um, you know, he's 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 taking a little break. I th- we think he's exploring some things, but we're sure he'll be back. And I was like, oh my god, that's just like denial. Like you know, if you come out to a, you know a different sexual orientation or a different whatever, and the parents are like, he's exploring. <laughs> we're sure he'll be back. <laughs> So that's how my parents saw it. And, and as you say, they went through the different stages of grief. You know, there was denial and then bargaining, you know, please, you know, what, what does it take to keep you <laughs> in the faith? And, uh, and then they went to talk with some businessman who was actually the, the chairman of uh, the Institute for Advanced Study Board of Trustees, a very famous businessman, president of the World Bank and the CEO of a famous bank. And they said, our son, Safi, we'd like to talk to you. We're very concerned. And he said, yes. And he said, well, he's leaving science for this thing called McKinsey for business. And we're very concerned. You know, it could be a problem. And he's like, uh, I think he'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they got over it eventually. But uh, when I went later into biotech, you know, McKinsey is about advising. And uh, uh, I knew I wanted to... Uh, 
help scientists actually create something and build something with their ideas and get it out of the academic lab and into patients and do something meaningful for the world. That, that really turned me on. That really excited me that if I could be part of doing something that mm -hmm. could help people uh, spend more time on earth with their loved ones that could extend life, that could improve quality of life. That just felt much more meaningful than previous things I'd been doing. Well, and one of the things you talk about in the book, which I think is really insightful, is that the person who comes up with the loom shot, and we'll have to define that in a minute, but that it's the person that takes that idea and, and moves it into the main mainstream more, that that's really as much of an essential ingredient as the person that comes up with the idea in the first place. Yeah, and I uh, both you and I work with uh, executive teams now, and uh, that's... Uh, one of the concepts that um, has been very useful. There's a whole series of things on how large, larger companies can innovate faster and better. And there's, there's no one magic wand. A lot of people sometimes oh, interview me like, tell me the three things in 45 seconds. It will make every large company in the world innovate faster and better. Go. <laughs> I'm like, really? That's, that's, I have a lot of those conversations too. You know, yeah, it's so please, surprising. Please, bullet, please. <laughs> it's so surprising. It's not a magic wand in 45 seconds. There's actually a lot of hard work and steps and processes. And, it, you know, there are things that you can do. Uh, you know, your book, Seeing Around Corner, is an example about understand when an inflection point is coming and how to think about it, which is great. And my book is on, you know, how do you operationally and practice nurture those loon shots without dropping the ball on the franchise and the core? And yeah, what are that. some things in in practice that matter, where do companies typically go wrong? And uh, just yesterday, actually, I, a lot of the last couple of years I've been spending with, um, we could talk more about that later, uh, but the US military and national security organizations mm -hmm. uh, who reach out to me afterwards because it's essential, you know, what, what, when we talk with private sector companies, it's, you know, getting that balance right and not killing the little loon shots, those very fragile little ideas that can become, that seem crazy, but end up becoming incredibly important. How do you avoid squashing them and how do you nurture them and what do you, what can you do in practice? Well, for private sector companies, it's a matter of p and mm -hmm. uh, but for the military, uh, the hospitals I speak with, it's a matter of life and death. Right. So um, getting that balance right, is important and one of the things you i um you you mentioned is one of the things i one of the list of things to, to understand and it's it's driven the the problem is driven by a failure to understand the difference mm -hmm. between an invention an inventor and a champion mm -hmm. someone who invents an idea and someone who champions an idea and people think oh you came up with a great idea awesome. Well, you know, just go sell it across the organization. And that's a disaster. Mm -hmm. The reason I'll give you an example, actually, as long as we're in the military, I'll give you an example. You know, a lot of people, a lot of popular histories attribute the development of radar, which ended up turning the course of World War II and uh, uh, helping the Allies defeat Nazi Germany to, you know, Britain in 1935. But in fact, when uh, Robert Watson Watt, you know, came up with this idea that we're examining death, you know, could death rays, you know, be created? And he said, well, I don't think a death ray is a real thing, but actually you could bounce light off of uh, radio waves off of planes and, you know, try to detect them. In fact, that idea has been suggested, had been suggested 15 years earlier inside the U.S. Navy, inside the, by a couple scientists who discovered it in Washington, D.C. They're trying to communicate between ships going down the Potomac and they saw that these signals interfered and they could use that to measure, uh, to detect ships, to detect planes. But that idea, when they applied to their superiors for you know, just a $5,000 check to explore that idea was rejected. For close to 10, almost 15 years, it was rejected. And then of course, Pearl Harbor, 1941, uh, we lost thousands of lives and much of that could have been prevented, much of the early losses in the war could have been prevented had we had early detection systems. So it, it is a matter of life and death, not quashing these ideas. And the problem, one of the problems is the failure to understand or appreciate. 
that the inventor of idea is not the same as the champion of the idea. So the guys who invented radar in the Navy in 1922 and for ships in 1930 for planes, they were terrific inventors. They were lousy champions. Mm -hmm. They didn't know how to sell their idea inside the large organization. Mm -hmm. It didn't succeed until another guy named Deke Parsons, Admiral Deke Parsons, who was a soldier who was, you know, not one of these creative artist scientist types, but it was a soldier who was bilingual. He understood science geek talk mm -hmm. and he understood soldier talk and he bridged the divide and he went over there. He went over to the Office of Naval Research across the Potomac and he saw, wait a minute, you guys just discovered this thing that could see planes <laughs> from miles away in, you know, in fog at night. Are you freaking kidding me? What the heck? You know, <laughs> and, he, and they're like, yeah, yeah, we, actually, that was eight years ago. Well, we found that. Well, let's go back to the, the definition, because I think it's for those that don't know the book. And it really is a fantastic book. It's called Loon Shots. Um, I have been immersed in it. And it's just great. Uh, but the, the what you talk about is the ideas that, you know, cure diseases, change wars are, are not like loon shots. Like we have this, uh, but they're, they're often dismissed. Um, there was just a recent example you pointed out, the woman that came up with the idea of what's now underlying the vaccine for right. <laughs> right. was was demoted. I mean, lost her academic job. I mean, it's a perfect example, right? Um, and, and your book really goes into wonderful cases about how, you know, the, the story of how these ideas actually came into the world. And what struck me as you go through all the different examples is how much history gets rewritten around yeah. completely the wrong things. <laughs> you know? And the book's just chock full of those examples. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I actually, that was super fun for me is, is pulling back the layers of the onion of what is popular histories. I mean, just in World War II, you know, the popular history is like, oh, uh, code breaking made a huge difference. You know, there was this great movie of uh, breaking the German code, how that, you know, helped turn the course of the war because you could figure out where the submarines were and you know Benedict Cumberbatch was in that movie and he's a great actor uh Kira Knightley is in that movie and she is awesome I'm a huge fan I have like a secret crush don't tell anybody especially not my wife because because something's definitely going to happen there <laughs> uh it's a great movie but it's you know based on a lie uh which is that in fact uh, code breaking had nothing to do with that uh winning the war there was B. Dines German intelligence had a thousand people breaking the British codes and they were far more successful and been reading every intercepted British naval traffic uh, for close to five years. That is not a great story. Wouldn't have been a great movie. No. Um, and as they say, you know, the, it's, it's the victors not only who write history, but who rewrite history. And that's what happened in the UK. The UK knew that, but buried that report for close to 30 years. So a couple of things that I wanted to just mention because our paths have sort of crossed um, in the book, you wrote about um, the Nokia invention of the iPad. Yeah. I happened to be in Finland in Ulu or somewhere and I held it. I actually held it in my hand. It was an Oh, iPad really? I didn't know device. that. Yeah. It was an iPad-like device. You used a stylus with it. And I was at Nokia's research center and they were showing this to me. And they said, look, it pulls up websites. It does this, it does that. And that would have been 2000. Four, two thousand three, yeah. something like that. I mean, early O's, early O's. They totally nailed it. And yet, again, you know, this this army, as you talk about, um, sort of sort of killed it. They didn't they didn't understand it. Um, so a couple of things in the book that I thought were just super interesting was your impatience with two concepts that have become very embraced, and one is culture. Oh, we need a culture of innovation. And nice. your argument is, no, that's not what we need. <laughs> and the other one is the theory of disruption, <laughs> which, uh, which I think is interesting. So maybe maybe tell us a little bit about the difference between culture and structure and, and how you orchestrate those things. So, the, you know, there's so much. When I started off as a CEO, uh, it was now 20 years ago, and I was, I, I was in my early 30s, um, I read everything I could find about you know how to be a better leader or manager and it was all you know culture 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 and uh after the first you know the first five versions of that that you read whether it's an hbr article or a book or some glossy magazine it's like oh yeah yeah i should you know empower employees is great and this you know these are all good things and then the next five you're like i feel like i've heard that before and then the next 500 is like i've heard that you know 500 times before 
for. <laughs> Yet all these companies that talk about culture and how their culture is great, you know, some of them do fine. And then some of them tank two weeks later, just after talking about how awesome their culture mm -hmm. is. So that's not a good correlation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the problem I have with sort of survey studies that are based on that is it's, it's very easy, as you know, if you work in drug discovery or in science, very easy to find correlations. I think one of my favorite one is um, the number of Nicolas Cage movies and the number of drowning accidents per year <laughs> is perfectly correlated over the last 20 years, right? So you find, you know, you do these surveys of like CEOs and do you prefer whiskey or scotch? And then you find the total return to shareholders from the companies whose CEOs drink whiskey rather than scotch is plus 22% higher. And then you see like three decimal points and they're like, wow, we should all stop drinking scotch and go drink whiskey. <laughs> but of course, if you do 10 of those, you'll always find something. So those, those I found very kind of silly and a bit dissatisfying, un unsatisfying as a scientist uh, who has seen a lot of that kind of silliness. By the way, I love that you tried to prepare for your role as CEO by doing research. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you what was the single most, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, the... Uh, in reality, it is the case that there are some patterns of, and I, I'm not, well, let, let me explain what I mean by culture versus structure. And what I, uh, the way to think about it is that culture is sort of the patterns of behavior that you see. You know, are employees accepting of new ideas and embracing them, or are they rigidly rejecting them and shooting them down? And structure is what's underneath that drives those patterns of behavior. So for example, incentives, what gets rewarded, what gets promoted. So as an example, if you are in an organization or a structure where uh, what's valued and what gets rewarded and, and how you reward people is by rank, then what people will focus on is getting promoted. And part of that is shooting down their neighbor's ideas. So by celebrating and rewarding rank, you start to create a political culture. By celebrating and rewarding risk-taking and intelligent risk-taking and results, you will start to encourage an innovative culture. And it's what's underneath the surface that drives those patterns of behavior. And the, the example I often use is, is a glass of water. You can have the molecules be totally rigid or sloshing around everywhere, completely random and wild. Now, no amount there of yelling at the molecules line up and be rigid or slash around and be loosey goosey is gonna make any difference. You can't melt a block of ice by saying, okay, you molecules, everybody start sloshing around. The block of ice will just look at you and sit there like a block of ice. However, if you change the temperature, a small change in temperature will melt the ice completely. So that's what I'm talking about structure. It's the equivalent to those small changes in temperature. Now, uh, that's not to say that there are uh, certain aspects of culture in the sense that it's typically used that are important. It's that both matter, but people just focus so much on this one that they neglect this one. Right. For example, it is probably not a good idea to have weekly floggings every Tuesday morning where you bring out some employees to the cafeteria and just publicly flog them. I don't think that's a good aspect of culture. Just saying. <laughs> it probably is a good idea to celebrate victories. As a person who is a public CEO for 14 or 13 years or whatever, those are some just general tips. So the point is that it's not that culture is absurd and you should never think about it zero. It's that so much of the business literature and the advice that CEOs or leaders get is just like, be not, be, do this or do that. And if it goes against the structure you've created, against what your incentives are, against how you've organized, against your uh, ways of communicating, it'll never work. Which is why so often people say, just as an example, you know, one of the things that you and I talk about, Alex Osterwalder talks about, is how do you balance the sort of artists and soldiers, the creative energy, exploring the crazy new ideas that you want to fail and want to take risk, and the soldiers who you're asking them to reduce risk on time, on budget, on spec, consistently with quality to customers. Mm -hmm. Those are two opposite goals. Mm -hmm. Those two groups, the artists and the soldiers, don't like each other, don't understand each other. 
The group making the money rarely likes the group spending the money and vice versa. That's true everywhere, public sector, private sector, some homes, just saying. <laughs> just saying, I don't wanna go too far with that one. <laughs> but they, they don't understand each other, they don't like each other and they, they come from different backgrounds. You know, you're a, a, you're a coder, you're a biologist, you're a chemist, you're a coffee machine designer, you value originality, beauty, how is my thing different from everybody else's? Isn't that cool? I wanna win an award, a Clio or whatever. And the soldier's like, here's my metrics, you know, here's my excitement is from improving my metric going from 98% to 99% to 99.9% and so on. Totally different values, totally different things they care. If they go out for beer together, they're not going to like enjoy each other. So part of your job as a manager or leader is to bridge that divide. And that's where actually a lot of leaders go wrong. It's like, it's to erase that divide. Everybody sing kumbaya and love each other. No, it's the exact opposite. Mm. Okay, if you try to get everybody to behave the same, you want the ice to be like water and the water to be like ice, you just get slush. You get nothing. You don't get good at either one of them. I, I think of the artist as I think of it as a beautiful baby problem. The artist has their new idea and they see it as this beautiful baby full of potential. And the soldier sees a shriveled up raisin covered in vomit and poop. Beautiful baby, vomit and poop. Right. And you actually you want that conflict. Right. If your artist is coming up and exploring the new crazy ideas, isn't excited about them, well, you kind of have a bigger problem. Why are they not excited about it? And are they going to succeed in, in really getting other people excited? On the other hand, if your soldier is overblown by the originality and the freshness and the newness of it and isn't carefully assessing it for what are the flaws we need to mitigate and what are the risks and how do we dial those down, you have a big problem with your soldiers. You need both and you need them both equally. You know, if you have a sales guy, a soldier who knocks on a customer's door and says, here's your toaster. And the customer said, toaster, I ordered a television. You, you're not going to have a lot of revenue left. Right. At the same time, if you don't have these artists exploring lots of crazy new ideas, mm -hmm. you know, then, you know, failing a lot. Well, the competitor who is failing a lot, who fails nine times and finds that 10th thing behind the nine failures you will find out about that too late when it's a bullet to your head. Mm -hmm. So you need both. And the different mindset is that is, is about your job as a manager is not to make them the same, is not to make them love each other. You want that conflict. You want to lean into that conflict. Mm -hmm. And your job is to bridge that divide. When there's all that friction that happens going between A and B and between B and A, your job is to ease that friction, not make it disappear, it's inevitable, mm -hmm. is to create ways that you reduce that friction, bring that divide. And in your signaling, in your signaling as a leader, anyone who's been in a, uh, a, a visible role as a leader knows that your staff, your employees are watching every gesture on your face. Everything you do like this, or you know, even if you're just cleaning your nose, they're like, oh my God, is he going to be fired? Is that guy going to be fired? Is my division down now? He, I think he just, he just sneezed. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, people watch everything you do, which is why it can be a little exhausting, but it, they watch everything you do. And it's very easy. It's a very common trap for a leader to signal. Mm -hmm. I love soldiers. These crazy hippies coming up with their new ideas. I'll give them lip service. But really, I love soldiers uh -huh. or vice versa. Like I think I wrote about, you know, Steve Jobs in his first incarnation did exactly the opposite. Speaking of wrong histories, he was exactly everything you should not do in what I'm talking about. He said, oh, only the pirates, you know, only us crazy wild artists working on the Macintosh project. This was in uh, early 80s are, are, are the great ones. All of you who are working on the, the, the franchise Apple products, you know, Apple three, et cetera, are bozos, right? And they got this little picture of Bozo the clown and, and uh, they, they, they got a red sash saying, we're not bozos, but he created so much hostility that the street between their buildings was called the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. <laughs> and it, it wasn't a good thing. It was the exact opposite. It was a complete disaster. When the Macintosh came out, it was a total flop. It was overpriced, it, over, it, it overheated, underpowered and, sales went down and Apple was headed for bankruptcy, right? What they actually needed was 
to love the artists and soldiers equally, to do well on the franchise, to get that product, you know, lower price, get the manufacturing costs down, get the memory up, stuff that's not as glamorous. And uh, so that was a disaster. And Apple was rapidly headed for bankruptcy. I j- at bankruptcy, I just talked with John Scully, actually, who came yeah. in and and uh, saved the day. And again, a wrong history. Like, oh, he did this. Actually, no, Apple was headed for bankruptcy because it was such a disaster, in part because of this failure to understand and failure to appreciate your artists and soldiers equally. Mm-hmm. And he came in and kind of turned that ship around and got it back mm-hmm. on track those first few years. Other things there were other problems later, but certainly mm-hmm. saved the day in those first few years. Mm-hmm. So yes, part of that is you have to uh, love your artists and soldiers equally, be very careful about your signaling. And part of that is, the, and a big part of that is the structure that you create. You can't be measuring this artist on the same stuff you're measuring the soldiers and vice versa. You can't go to your engineers, your scientists and say, I think you had uh, 4.2 ideas on Monday, 4.4 ideas on Tuesday. It's Wednesday at 3 p.m. I'm only seeing you at 3.2 ideas. We really need to crank up the number of ideas. They'll think you're a moron and they they will leave the company. And you would be. (laughs) And they will leave. But that's actually, I'm exaggerating for a little fun, but that's what happens when you don't think about structure. And you say, we have some measurement systems, we have some risk management, we have some reward systems, and you have the same reward and measurements and incentives for people on both sides. Yet, one side you want to take risk, the other side you want to reduce risk. Should you really be, should your incentives and structures be the same? Obviously not. So that's what I mean by structure. And if you get the structure right, then you will start to get the culture. You'll get these guys evaluating the crazy ideas the way you would like them and you get these guys reducing risk the way you would like them and you'll start to find ways to bridge that divide. So one of the stories in your book uh, reminded me of an experience I had. So this would have been the early O's, you know, and I was hired by 3M to come and teach in a thing they called their Accelerated Leadership Development Program. And uh, Jim McNerney had just come in from GE to run the fabled 3M. He lost oh my it. God, yeah, I use that you example. Know, <laughs> he lost his CEO succession race to, uh, to, to Jack Welsh and had joined 3M. And everybody was like, oh, thank God, you know, he's gonna bring necessary discipline and he's gonna bring Six Sigma into the company. And I remember sitting in a building that was a converted, um, I think it was like a converted squash court or something, you know. <laughs> which they turned into a training center and uh, talking to the R and D guys who were there and they're like, you know, and everybody's had these name badges, right. With five corporate values behind them. And everybody had the metrics and we're going to do six Sigma for innovation. And I sort of looked at them, like, you realize this is not going to work, right. You do know this. <laughs> of course, the whole innovation engine sputtered to a complete halt. McNerney went off to Boeing, I think. Um, and they brought people in who were like back to the, you know, loving the artists and the soldiers again. And, but it was a a fascinating example to me because of course, you know, you cannot move for business school case studies of 3M's, you know, famous innovation system, right? Uh, But yeah, so I was, I was definitely in the middle of that. So moving on to some of your more recent thinking, um, you've got a couple of Wall Street Journal articles. You talk about Manover Bush with, you know, immense admiration. And some of the questions in the chat are about, you know, what do we need right now? Like as a, as a country, as a nation, uh, what do we need to get right? Because um, Bush was an extraordinary person and I think got some extraordinary championing. Um, there was a lot of urgency to what he was doing. Um, and I just wonder if, you know, you've written about maybe replicating something like that today. Uh, well, that's a super relevant question since I, uh, some part of this book started with right. working with President Obama's Council of Science Advisors and, you know, what's next after Vannevar Bush's mm-hmm. Uh, for people who don't know, Vannevar Bush was a engineer, was a provost of MIT, who at the start of World War II quit his job, talked his way into a meeting with FDR and said, we need to completely change um, how the military goes about its job because we're going to lose this war. The military is doing fine on you know building bigger, faster ships and bigger, faster planes, but the new technology uh, that's going to make a difference in this war Uh, Nazi Germany is ahead of us and we will never catch up in time and we will lose, which was actually correct, which is exactly how things played out over the next few years. But fortunately, FDR listened to him 
and created a new structure uh, for the military and for national research, which grew into National Science Foundation, DARPA, mm -hmm. many of the things that gave us. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh. Yeah, the, the system that Bush set up uh, around 1940, the Office of Science, the OSRD, mm -hmm. um, when uh, after FDR won his fourth term in 1994, uh, in December, he called Vannevar Bush into his office and he said, well, what's going to happen to this system that you invented for innovating astonishingly fast, this new structure, and uh, when the war is over? And Van Bush said, well, it's, it's gonna fall flat on its face, just like science did for the last 20 or 30 years between these World War I and World War II, and we'll be in the same position again. So FDR asked him, he said, well, why don't you go and create a proposal for how we can internalize this and keep this going in times of peace to help the, improve the national well-being, improve uh, health, improve, uh, create jobs. So Bush turned around and came back about six months later with what's called Endless Frontier. I think I have that here somewhere. Yeah, Endless Frontier, his report in ah. 1945, which laid the foundations for the National Research Infrastructure of the United States, which was the project I was asked to do for President Obama's Council mm -hmm. of Science Advisors. That gave us the NSF, the expanded the NIH, uh, DARPA, which led to GPS, the internet, the biotechnology industry, the chemotherapy cure for cancer, lasers, roughly half of the trillions of dollars of GDP growth since World War II is attributed hmm. to the new technologies. Much of the early personal computer industry, 3D graphics, all of that came from federal research projects, which not many people realize. And that's why the US has led the world in science and technology ever since for the last 70 years. Mm -hmm. So that's what Vannevar Bush did. But to your question, that's not gonna work anymore. Firstly, other countries, notably China and Russia in particular, have figured that out. Mm -hmm. it, it took a while, but they got it. And so they're replicating what uh, we've done and what Vannevar Bush has done. And especially China is just moving faster and faster and now is essentially a peer uh, with us in many of the key technologies. In, in fact, one not very well known fact is that we have essentially a perfect record in war games, the games that the military runs against China, which is we lose like 100 out of 100 times, oh, no. <laughs> which is not good. No. <laughs> so one of the, re it's, it, it's kind of similar to some of the stuff I'm doing with private sector companies, but essentially we're in a different world today in a very important way that what worked for the last 70 years for organizations won't work for the, certainly for the next 70, but probably not even the next 20 and not even the next 10. And that's because the pace of innovation has accelerated, uh, primarily driven from the fact in the military case that what creates battlefield advantage is shifting from hardware to software. And while it takes years to create a new piece of hardware, it can take months or weeks to create a new piece of software. So that requires innovating at a pace and scale that we haven't done before. We've started most of the prior wars or conflicts um, behind our enemies, but caught up. We may not be so lucky next time, which is in fact why we keep losing in these war games. And for uh, private sector companies, it's about the pace of competition. You can't organize the, the standard rules that have applied and the theories that have applied for the last 70 years won't work when the pace of innovation is a week, right? It, it's fine if it's a couple of years for your competitor to create a product, to your point about seeing inflections in what's coming around the corner. If that time scale is a year or a couple of years, okay. But if that time scale is a week, you're dead. I'm exaggerating, it may not be a week, it may be three weeks, but you, you know what I mean. Software can change like that. TikTok, how long did it go from zero to a billion? Yeah. Months, right? Yeah. Not, not, not 10 years, which is sort of a previous time scale. You look at uh, like Reliance Geo in India. Yes. In, launched in 2016 and they were at 100 million users in, yeah. uh, in, in not seven months. I mean, unbelievable. Right, and so the, the old model of an organization, what used to work, won't work uh, 
going forward when the, that pace of competition has accelerated mm -hmm. uh, from years to weeks to kind of new products that can kill your business. And so that's what I, I talk about is what is that new model and what is it, what are people typically missing? And a few companies that I think have figured it out well. And the, the kind of the way I describe it is a, the old model is, well, you've got uh, if you imagine a car, you've got pistons and you've got wheels. You know, let's say that the pistons are the on time, on budget, on spec, and the wheels are the crazy new ideas. And yeah, let's let's get an R and D lab and let's you know let's get some soldiers and you know we'll sort of hope it works out. And when stuff you know when they bicker, it sort of filters up the layers to the executive team or the leadership, and then we try to resolve the bickering and go back and forth and back and forth. And eventually, if you're lucky, new stuff pops out. And, and if you're unlucky at resolving the bickering, you know, you're too slow and you get killed. Um, or you never do it. You squash it like Nokia did or, or, or many other examples. New model is you create a special forces inside that help. That's, and you can think of that as the oil, right? A car needs pistons and it needs wheels, but to run at high speeds, it needs oil. And it can't be the CEO that's resolving the bickering or the EVPs that are resolving the bickering. Um, a few companies that do this well, and uh, you know, some folks that I've worked with and helped them understand what this means and what are the skill sets. You know, you need a special forces, and they're just focused on mediation. Mm -hmm. That's all they do. Mm -hmm. They are the project champions. They are the ones when the inventor comes up with the idea and is a lousy champion to come back to what you and I were talking about in the beginning, they are the ones that play that role. Hey, there's a great invention. You discovered radar, but you don't know how to sell it to a general. Or you have created something like an iPad, but you can't articulate why it's a good business. And so it gets killed. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who say who are bilingual. Mm -hmm. They understand what language will work with business leaders or CEOs or managers or the manufacturing guys who will resist anything new. Their job is to reduce risk. So they want you out of their way. They don't want anything new. They want to just do their job that they get promoted and paid for or the sales guys. That's what happened at Xerox is people get that story wrong all the time. What really happened is that the sales guys were being paid per number of typewriters and number of copy machines. So when there's a new product, no matter how much they think it's personally cool, they got a mortgage. If they're being paid, this is what I mean by culture or structure. There was nothing wrong with the Xerox culture. It was the structure. You know, they got a mortgage. They got kids in school. I'm being paid on number of typewriters and copy machines I push. So am I going to push, you know, take hours out of my day to listen to this weird new thing called a personal computer? Because, you know, I have to read this 87 page PowerPoint you know, or whatever manual and it doesn't work. And if I show it to my customer, he's going to be really pissed off because it doesn't work. I just... That was, you know, in four hours, I could have made 60 phone calls and gotten, you know, 10 leads and closed three deals. You just, you just cost me three deals, which is this amount of dollars out of my kid's mouth. So no, so that was structure versus culture to come back to another point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so the old model of organization won't work. You can't just rely on having these two groups and <coughs> resolving the bickering ad hoc. You need a special forces. Uh, so that's what I talk about with public sector as well as private sector companies. That's one of the things you need to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're at a very strange moment sort of in history. And one of the things I've been super concerned about is uh, a lot of wealth being extracted from companies that could have been reinvested in science, in innovations, in discovering the next thing. Um, do, you, do you see any way that we can begin to infuse some of this thinking in that kind of structure? Right. I think one thing that's been missing that has become abundantly clear from the current pandemic is that the uh, U.S. Um, government, the federal government, has correctly prioritized uh, nuclear weapons as a threat for which we need federal investment, uh, basic science research, which is a competitive advantage. That's the lesson of the last 70 years. Uh, is something that needs federal investment. And the underlying umbrella for those, the underlying way to think about it, which has important implications for what we should do for the next 50 years, is this 
idea or principle called market failure. And you and I are big proponents of free markets. There's probably been never, there's never been a system for driving innovation better than, you know, free capital markets. But even Adam Smith, if you go and you look back at Wealth of Nations, understood that markets will fail for the very simple and very obvious reason when there is an important objective that benefits everybody collectively, but not any one group right. individually. Yes, exactly. As an example, it, I mean, nuclear weapons is an obvious one. It doesn't really benefit, you know, if I'm running a biotech company, I'd like to invest some energy money <coughs> in preventing nuclear war. That's kind of absurd, but it's pretty important for everybody collectively. You know, 40 years ago to stick to biotech, it didn't make sense for pharma you t to invest in, you know, genetic engineering. In, in hindsight, it's like, oh yeah, that would have been a great thing. But it was so risky and so uncertain with no clear payoff, CEOs correctly and boards of directors correctly said, I can't put shareholder dollars against this really weird thing called genetic engineering because the return on investment is so completely <coughs> negative that it makes no sense whatsoever. And they were right. Mm -hmm. Or GPS, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar investment. It benefits the entire country and all of our <coughs> electronics manufacturers, but it wasn't worth, no one company could have invested in it. Something we all take for granted, the transistor. You and I wouldn't be having this Zoom call. The electronics <laughs> industry wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the transistor. Mm -hmm. To get the transistor, you need these incredibly pure silicon and germanium crystals. Why would any company invest in growing pure silicon and germanium crystals? Why? You didn't know that you could make a little sandwich of them and create an electronic switch which would transform the world within 20 years. So you need those investments. Those are called market failures. Mm -hmm. Investments in things that don't benefit any one group, person individually or company individually, but benefit society as a whole. Mm -hmm. Viruses, bacteria, pathogens is an example of a market failure. What happened 18 years ago when we got the first SARS-CoV-1, first SARS virus, is that scientists started working on Mm -hmm. drugs that could defeat a SARS type virus. And that first SARS virus was 80% genetically identical to the one that we have right now. Sure. Had, they, had there been federal research that had supported that 18 years ago, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in today with trillions of dollars of losses around the world because we would have been investing in continuing the research, which looked promising mm -hmm. back then. So what I hope we take out of this to get to your question is that biological threats are an example, just like nuclear weapon or, or highway systems or, or, or uh, you know, developing a transistor or the biotechnology research. They're an example of a market failure. You need the federal government to step in and invest in preventing these disasters because it is correctly not in any one interest of any one individual player. The return on that is too low. Mm -hmm. So that's what I hope we will take away is that we have a better appreciation for the role of federal government. Now there are, you know, sort of anti-government uh, libertarian types. Uh, and while I'm sympathetic to a number of those points of view is about there's a lot of waste in government, it misses the fact that there really is such a thing called the market failure. It's called, it, go back 200 years, 250 years, and read Adam Smith, who said there are certain things that a free market will not accomplish. And those are things that are bad for any one person individually, but good for industries and markets and society as a whole. So I hope one of the things that will come out of this is the appreciation of the need for certain type, absolute need and urgent need for certain types of federal investment. Um, and in this particular case with the pandemic, federal investment in biological defense. Mm -hmm. And one of the, um, uh, well, so just, I could not agree with that more. Just, it's so important. And, you know, we get, we get ourselves all tangled up in these arguments about the just talk <laughs> past each other, you know? Um, but one of the fun things about knowing you in the pandemic, and actually I think 
part of the way we got to know each other at a, a function. I, I remember calling you up and saying, I've got this guy in England who has this drug thing. He wants me to write letters oh, to right. I forgot about that. for. Remember that? I was yeah. supposed to write a letter to the CEO for this compound <laughs> we did. And I had no idea like how I to totally frame about that. that. Right. <laughs> and you very kindly agreed to talk me through that, which was which was great. And it turned out to be absolutely the correct advice. Um, but you had kind of a seat at the table at some of these discussions about the virus, drug companies coming together who normally are, you know, died in the wool competitors. Oh yeah. Um, can you give us a, a not, not betraying any confidence, of course, but a, a sneak peek at what some of that's been like kind of behind the scenes? It is an amazing and kind of wonderful thing to see. I think the only thing I can compare it to is uh, um, right after 9-11, I happened to be in Manhattan at the time. Um, and, you know, New York is not the friendly. This is, I'll let you in in the secret. Not the friendliest place in the world. <laughs> what are you saying? Forget really? It. <laughs> it, it, it's a shocker. Not the most, I'm just going to put this out there. Not the most courteous people in the world. Just putting that out there. Um, but right after 9-11, I mean, not, not uh, aside from, you know, the shock of, of seeing that happen on our homeland, it was just, the, the, the change in patterns of behavior, cab drivers couldn't possibly have been nicer and more courteous to passengers and vice versa. And everybody came together. Mm -hmm. Everybody came together. I spent a bunch of my youth in Israel and it's like that as well. Mm -hmm. When you're being bombarded and are kind of at war all the time, everybody, there's this incredible brotherhood. Everybody you know, there's a, someone's, over, you know, the car is pulled over and tires flat, you know, 20 people will stop to help them out. Mm -hmm. right? There's this incredible togetherness. And that's what happened in the biotech and pharma industry and mm -hmm. drug discovery uh, starting in, you know, probably as soon as January, February, as soon as people read about it and knew it, stuff that would take you know, contracts that would take six months to negotiate typically. Oh, I'm a small biotech. Would you like to partner with me on my drug? Well, let me send my, here's my junior biz dev guy. And then let me send my junior scientist to talk to your scientist. And then we'll escalate it up to your senior scientist and our senior scientist. And then you can send a proposal. And then, you know, six months later, <clears throat> you know, you're debating the contract, which goes back and forth between the IP people and the legal people. And, you know, it's a giant hassle and it takes forever. And then eventually you sign stuff would get done in 24 hours. It was amazing. And this was over and over and over. And not just between a little company and a big company, but sometimes between big companies. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's, you know, it's, it's somewhat of a small world. The chief medical officer at Pfizer and his buddies with the CMO at Novartis, his buddies, with, you know, they, they've all grew up together and people are, so it's a bit of a small world, which helps. Mm -hmm. But then you just pick up the phone and you call your counterpart at Novartis or at Pfizer or at GlaxoSmithKline or at Merck and you say, listen, you have this asset, this, you know, let's say you're making a vaccine, but we need an adjuvant, the thing that helps stimulate the blood so that the vaccine works better. Why don't we just put the two of us together? Let's start an experiment. Mm -hmm. Done. I'm getting off the phone. I'm calling my guy, call your guy. And we start working without the lawyers signing a contract, wow. which you know, almost never, as you know, never happens. And, you know, first the lawyers and you have to paper everything and it takes, you know, months to like, just start the science. We'll figure out the paperwork later. Over and over and over that would happen. The FDA, you know, you, you would hit a bump, you put in a, you know, um, as a number of people have said, who had drugs that were pretty advanced and reasonable, showing reasonable promise, they would get a call back in hours from the head of the FDA. Is mm -hmm. there anything else I could do for you? How can I help? Wow. You know, that kind of stuff never would happen. Um, so it's just an incredible s spirit of collaboration that mm -hmm. did not exist mm -hmm. uh, before. And it was recognized that, you know, this is not about uh, financial interest. This mm -hmm. is kind of why we're doing the job. I think people, you know, who are outside, and it's sort of common when you're not in it, you don't know people personally, you sort mm -hmm. of, paint them in this one box, uh, you know, villains or this or that. Mm -hmm. And they're just regular people like you and me who have, you know, a spouse and kids and can't work the, you know, the, the Zoom. remote control <laughs> or the Zoom. Mute. And, yeah. <laughs> mute, mute. How do I get off? Right? Mute. 
you know, they're just regular people and they, they're in their jobs because they want to do good. Mm-hmm. So you, you work in drug discovery because you want to do good. You do, it's not like Silicon Valley, you know, in the, these internet companies where, you know, if we build this website and get a million clicks next week, we'll be billionaires or something. Mm-hmm. It's like we're one of many of a large team that is needed to get a drug to the finish line. But at the end, this large team, when you do get the drug to the finish line, you will feel incredibly satisfied for the rest of your life that you help people live longer. And that, those are the real people. And when this, when COVID happened, this was their moment and they rose to that moment. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of a beautiful thing to see. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. So during the pandemic, right? Um, how have you been keeping yourself busy? Uh, and what have you not been doing? Not mentioning anything in particular. <laughs> You don't want me to say I haven't been showering or something. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no God no, I forbid. Think, I think like, that would I, never happen. No I way. Would, I, would, I, I have this mental image of your wife chasing you around your abode with scissors. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it, that conversation has come up. Like my daughter was making fun of me. It's like, Daddy, it's not three inches. It's not six inches. It's a foot. I'm like, huh. I, now I'm getting this from all sides here. Okay. Um, but... Uh, no, I, I have uh, two research projects that I love, love, love. So I'm deep in the cave. As much as I enjoy going out and working with, you know, leadership teams and, and, and talking about this stuff, I am deep, deep, deep in the cave on uh, one is kind of a, a beautiful technical problem, which uh, you know, is, a, is a mystery that's been around in some sense for 30 years, in some sense for 50 years, in some sense for 200 years. Why do markets crash? Mm. And how do we understand these mysteries of, capital mm. markets because all these Nobel prizes that have been given for, you know, markets and efficient markets and random walks, they don't crash mm. yet. Weird thing. Like when I asked my Uber driver, do markets crash? It's like, what are you talking? Of course they crash. Yet you have 11 Nobel prizes that say that they don't crash. Huh. So how you, uh, uh, there is a new framework that I sort of came up with a little bit of an offshoot of loon shots, which is about why companies suddenly change. It's mm. about why markets suddenly change and kind of, what was missed and a different framework for thinking about that. And that's how that answers uh, some puzzles that have been around for a long time, excess volatility puzzle for which Bob Schiller won the Nobel prize of why is it that corporate earnings uh, seem disconnected, much less volatility in corporate earnings, much less than volatility in market value. And so framework gives a very simple and straightforward answer for that. And the mystery of the distribution of return. Anyway, it's, what I've been doing is like every day until 1 a.m., uh, 2 a.m., I'm doing that technical problem, uh, the book on strategy. So I'm kind of parallel processing on two different projects and books that are really fun and interesting for me. And so that's, that's in good. between, I do the kind of advising stuff. So that's how I spend my time. That's fun. So how do people learn more? Oh, goodness, look at the time. How do people learn more? Where where, should, where would you point them? Uh, go to my website, Loonshots. Dot com. I have a newsletter. You sign up. You get the latest updates. Um, Great. Twitter, usual stuff, LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> Same well, as you. Same as me, right? Okay. Um, anyway, so thank you so much. This has just been, the time has flown. And, you know, we could have done this all day, I think. Yeah, there's um, so much more we could talk about it. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, thank you. And Absolutely. Uh, to be continued. <laughs> to be continued. Okay. Thanks for having me.